namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa aparuta de sangama tassa tavara ye sarvanta bhamunchantu satang So this past week, Quiet Week, I uh, wish we had Quiet Weeks every week. <laughs> so the quietness, stillness, emptiness, non-self, then there's the noisy world, sound, sight, smell, taste, touch, thinking, emotions. Well, there's a quote from a Roman philosopher of the, around the period of 480 AD. Uh, it goes, if it sticketh to the constancy of the supernal mind, which needs not move, it is superior to the necessity of fate. So that, I rather like that as a reflection. If it sticketh to the constancy of the supernal mind. And to me that means the awareness, the, the stillness, the internal stillness, the unshakable conscious uh, with awareness, the constancy of the supernal, mind that needs not move, superior to the necessity of fate. So the necessity of fate is all the conditioned realm. You know, we're, our fate is death, isn't it? Being born, our fate means we're all going to die. And so that's pretty, putting it in rather stark, unromantic, uh, uh, direct terms. But this is a reflection, it's not a kind of depressing uh, fact, but recognizing f when we use the word fate, uh, <coughs> what is that? It's an English word, and being born means we we have our fate is to is to die. All that is born dies. Well, that's uh, reflecting on the way conditioned phenomena is. It's not saying it's good or bad, but that's the way it is. And so in Vipassana meditation, the Buddha is always pointing to that all conditions are impermanent. Uh, and so that this is the all that begins ends. So the fate of all that begins is end, ending. Then if, if it sticketh to the constancy of the supernal mind, it is superior to the necessity of fate. So fate is a necessity, isn't it? It's a, we're all having to live through our vipaka kama as it arises uh, in the present moment. The necessity of fate is like vipaka kama, that which, you know, uh, the conditions for this feeling, for this emotion, for this memory, for uh, feeling hot or cold, pleasure, feeling pleasure, pain, Whatever, changing condition is the way it is. And the reason why we have these conditions is because of birth. Because we're born into these human forms, uh, which are sensitive forms, conscious forms, uh, and so we have, we're fated to feel and be sensitive. Having a physical body like this, Eyes that see, ears that hear, the nose that smells, tongue that tastes, body that is a sensitive form, pleasure, pain, heat and cold, and the thinking mind, the emotional habits, the memories. So in this uh, reflection on the five khandhas, 
the Buddha used these uh, particular teachings because they're uh, it's kind of making making everything more easy. If you have five khandas, you have five groups, and then uh, and to put everything. I remember one of the translations uh, of the five khandas was. Uh, I remember years ago. I don't think they still use it, but if you see in some translations of Pali of the Pali Canon, they call it the four heaps. And uh, a heap is just a pile of stuff, isn't it? It's not a, an ordered kind of uh, alphabetically numbered, uh, neatly uh, transcribed uh, setting for anything. It's merely like a pile of something. <clears throat> so the English word heap and kanda, I quite, quite like that because it, it does get the point across, like the, the, the rupa kanda, the body, Put all these bodies in a heap, <laughs> or or uh, way dana feeling, pleasure, pain, or neutral, another heap, and so you're not making anything, you know, that interesting or that important about any any of the conditions. You know, the, how am I feeling about my feelings or my my views and opinions or my sensitivities or my own body in terms of giving it a kind of importance but putting it in these five aggregates or five groups or five heaps is a way of beginning to loosen the, uh, the uh, strong sense of attachment to the conditioned world, to phenomena. So this, uh, in the five khandas, is rupa khanda, the body, vedana, the feeling, uh, sensitivity, um, attraction, aversion, and so forth, uh, a neutral feeling that arises through the senses. Sanya, perception, memory. Sankhara can be translated as uh, uh, thinking or emotion and then vinyana. So the question, uh, people ask me the question and, uh, uh, because I use vinyana as, uh, as the unconditioned. And yet in the five khandas, vinyana is considered anicca dukkha nata. So this is uh, now this, now recognize that these are expedient means. Five, when there's rupa and vinyana. And then the other three, isn't it? The vedana, sanya, sankhara. This is the conditioning process. Vedana, sanya, sankhara. When, you're, when a baby's born, it has rupa and vinyana. And uh, rupa is born, vinyana isn't born. The rupa, the body of a baby is born, and so it's uh, functioning as an independent physical form that's conscious. So uh, just reflecting on, uh, we, we tend to think of consciousness as in the body, as if it's in the brain or, you know, it's inside us. But is that really the experience? Is, is vijnana or consciousness? We're experiencing consciousness, but is it, and, and through this form, through the body, through the physical human form. Now that's natural, those are natural conditions. The body belongs to nature. It's a condition born and dies, it's made up the four elements, uh, this uh, solid, liquid, air, and fire, four elements. It's conscious, it's in space. So we're experiencing space and consciousness in a form. So th what I'm doing is trying to convey to you the, how to reflect on the reality of this present moment. 
I'm not asking you to kind of grasp what I'm teaching or saying as some kind of Ajahn Sumato take on Dhamma, but it's more of a, because uh, I don't want you to, to identify this with me, but I'm sharing my own insight and, and encouraging a kind of reflection how to use these teachings so <clears throat> they're not just grasped in, in terms of definitions that you get from uh, books or dictionaries, teachers. Because these, uh, the five khandhas, uh, the six ayatanas, the uh, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, mind, all these are expedient means for liberation from birth and death, superior to the necessity of fate. <coughs> now then the uh, Buddha emphasized that mindfulness is the, is the way, that's the path. That if we're, when we're not mindful, then we're caught in the conditions that we're, you know, the, uh, identity with the body, with the feelings, with the memories, with the emotions, and then consciousness is always distorted through that attachment. So I just notice that suffering that we experience is how much we suffer through the distortion that, we, that we're attached to of me as a, this, I'm this body, I'm this person, and the memories, the emotions we have, we're very attached to our feelings, our reality is, is, uh, is feeling, isn't it? We feel, we have to, we're sensitive forms. But feeling is a condition. An identity with feeling, attachment to feeling, is the cause of suffering. So we're not trying to get rid of feeling, but put it in, in its proper position so we're no longer just helpless victims of our feelings. Because when we see things through the distortion of ignorance, of avicca, of not understanding Dhamma, not realizing the supernal mind which needs not move, then we are always caught in the motion, the ups and downs of the conditions that we're experiencing. So that's why the world is the way it is, why society is like this, why uh, international problems, politics, and uh, the economy, and the so social problems, and the wars, and the ethnic uh, prejudices, racial prejudices, and uh, all like that, are all about ignorance and attachment to conditions. So it's, it's uh, you know, this is, uh, this is the ignorance of our humanity that the Buddha was pointing at. That the way out of this is through awakening, through mindfulness and reflection, investigating. So these, uh, like these Four Noble Truths are for investigation. Yoniso Manasikara in the Pali terms, looking into, getting to the very root. The court the causes of suffering, suffering and its causes. And then, and that's the first two, the, the first, second noble truth. Then the third and fourth is all about cultivating emptiness or non-attachment. inward, like superior to the necessity of faith. This is just one way of expressing it. But, but with mindfulness, it's not about superior or inferior anymore. These words that convey quality and quantity, position, these are conditions. They arise and cease. They're anicca, dukkha, anatta. So, and, and the thinking mind, the way that, you know, when we attach to thinking, to the rational thinking process, or the emotional habits, 
when we attach to what our emotions tell us and what our our memories and thoughts and views and opinions, no matter how intelligent or foolish or insane or sensible or stupid they might be, they're all conditioned phenomena. And that which knows, which is aware of conditioned phenomena, is not a condition. Well, consciousness is the ability to know, isn't it? Where this is, uh, it's not, uh, consciousness is, is the universe we're in. It has no boundary. But we experience consciousness through a form. So that's the, the human birth is, is, uh, is this. It's having to experience um, this planetary life, this sensitive realm, through a sensitive form. And so that consciousness is, is pure in itself. It's not personal. It's not mine. It's not, uh, I can't claim it as uh, some kind of personal quality that I have or that I have any more than you do or it's different in any way. Say, consciousness is not about, is not conditioned. So it's, it's immeasurable. It's ability to know, it's sensitivity, it's intelligence and discerning. But we connect intelligence with discrimination. So, you know, our education, our whole modern educational system is based on discriminating through thinking, through rational, through rationalization, logic, um, these abilities to use thought in skillful ways, to have terms, to project names and, and uh, values onto conditioned phenomena. So we have good and bad, right and wrong, true and false, Heaven and hell. And so this is, these are terms that we project onto conditions. So languages are, uh, you know, can, uh, created by human ignorance. And the, the, I mean, they, they can be used, um, ignorance in this sense is not understanding Dhamma. So we, you know, we, we have language, we have memory, we, we have uh, social values, cultural values, uh, morals, uh, ideals, we have uh, hellish realms, we have uh, criminality, cruelty and brutality, demonic forms, angelic ones, refined and coarse. Now the necessity of fate then lies in that, in the, that whatever we we tend to attach to, we we are uh, we become that out of ignorance, out of avicca, not understanding them, and then we tend to become whatever we attach to. So that's why morality is uh, such a, a, a condition sine qua non of of a proper kind of human behavior. We have to agree on behavior because uh, we're, we have this, this, this gamut of the, the best to the worst from the uh, heavenly realms of Brahma to the, to the satanic. This potential within our minds, within consciousness, these conditions arise. So as human beings, we, we have moral codes, like in the Theravada Buddhism, the five precepts, isn't it? The five precepts is a kind of basis of moral agreements on how to live with each other in a society, in a family, in a community, in which we, we agree that to not kill, steal, uh, exploit, uh, and misuse our sexuality not to use our speech for deceiving, lying, or har harming others, or uh, refraining from uh, intoxicants and, and uh, mind-changing drugs. 
So this is uh, this is a, a we are you know in in Buddhist uh, tradition you have to ask for the precepts. I've always liked that. In uh, what attracted me to Buddhism, one one of the things I really appreciated was it put morality in a proper position for me because uh, my own cultural background was it wasn't so clear. Like like you could have uh, like immoral thoughts to, you know, you could have, uh, and that you, you weren't moral person if you had immoral thoughts. Uh, where in Buddhism, it's, uh, if we, we have immoral thoughts, we, we're aware of them, but we don't act on them or speak on them. So this gives us a chance to, to investigate in order to understand our humanity the, the state we're in, this planet that we live on, the, the, the consciousness that we're, that we're experiencing through the forms, the necessities of fate that we find ourselves in. Like the necessity of fate of Ajahn Sumato, being this monk, this person, this form. An awareness of it doesn't mean it's, 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 it's evaluating it in terms of good, bad, best, worst, or whatever. It's recognizing that the body's like this. The, the title Ajahn Sumato is, a, is another projection. It's a convention to use, but it's not a grasping of it. Then as a Buddhist monk, where you're living a celibate life, you, you, you determine to live uh, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, state of celibacy. But you still have sexual uh, energy. The body still has its, when the conditions for uh, sexual arousal are present, the, one is, uh, the body certainly is aware of it. We feel it. But because of our determination when we become uh, samanas to refrain from acting on sexual uh, energy, we refrain from acting on it, but we're aware of it. And that which is aware of sexuality is not self, not a condition, superior to the necessity of fate. Sexuality is a necessity of fate. In other words. And yet, you know, in the Western world, we take sexuality as something very personal. It's, uh, you know, good or bad, right or wrong, uh, moral or immoral, uh, elevated to, uh, to the ultimate human experience or denigrated to a filthy kind of habit. Or we can put it into any context for, in, and evaluate it according to to particular cultural or religious values. But in uh, the Samana life, the important thing is to recognize it. That which is aware of sexual energy, when the conditions for this particular feeling arise, there's an awareness of it. That awareness is superior to the necessity of fate. Or it's the way that we can actually put sexual energy into a context of Dhamma rather than seeing that as impersonal values or just trying to suppress it or, or fear it or despise it or dread it. If you've taken, uh, uh, the, if you, you know, if you're a celibate, then of course, what do you do? You can't, there's no way that you can deal with it other than through being aware, learning. So it's not about suppressing, becoming some kind of, uh, you know, anti, you know, seeing sex as something to be frightened of or something to despise, but something to learn from. Not through acting on it, but through recognizing its impermanence. Being that which is aware, sticky, sticketh to the constancy of the supernal mind that needs not move. Then in the Majjhima Nikaya, there's a very good sutta called the Badeka Rati Sutta. And it's translated as the uh, 
one fortunate attachment. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, one fortunate attachment. And of course, it's about sticking to the supernal mind, recognizing that mindfulness, awareness, combined with consciousness and wisdom. Sticking to it. What does that mean? You know, and sticking to something. Once you recognize it, so in the Four Noble Truths, the important thing is recognizing. So that's what the Third Noble Truth, that's what it's about, is recognizing, realizing what they call the cessation of condition. Niroda, Niroda, cessation, Niroda Satcha. Now, one can, you know, if you take that too literally from the, from the uh, rational thinking mind without insight, then we, it sounds almost uh, nihilistic or annihilationist, doesn't it? Like a, Theravada Buddhism easily lends itself to the criticism of being annihilationist. Because it, uh, you know, talks about extinction, about cessation, about non-self. Its, uh, it, its whole way of expression uh, on the intellectual level is, is not about grasping or finding something. It's not about getting happy or finding heaven, but in letting go of conditions. So that is um, to recognize cessation means that that which recognizes when a condition ceases, in, ceases in consciousness. You don't kind of go into unconscious state when, when a thought or an emotion cease. At least I don't. You know, things arise and cease, thoughts come and go, emotions change. And that which is aware is conscious, the awareness and consciousness. But it's the constancy of the supernal mind that needs not move. So that I would put into the category of the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. So what the Buddha is really pointing at is liberation from ignorance, from birth and death. Now how does that strike you? Is he pointing to extinction, annihilation, cessation as a kind of total wipeout, a kind of empty void of nothingness? We can create that in the mind. We can, we can think of a void of nothingness, of annihilation. Or we can create uh, an eternal heaven, like uh, a heaven where everybody is happy all the time. Like a childlike heaven where you, we are all just happy and we get everything we want and everybody's beautiful and kind and sweet. We can create an ideal of heaven or annihilation or of hell. We can, we can create a image of uh, permanent misery, of hell where there's unmitigated, unending pain and misery and torture and brutality. So in the human, human ability to create out of ignorance of Dhamma, not being awake and not being aware, we tend to recreate conditions we take condition phenomena and just rearrange them all the time. You know, so we, we uh, try to create new conditions or new ideals or new arrangements. Or what the Buddha is pointing at is awakening to reality in which the real is the deathless rather than uh, some kind of uh, 
annihilation uh, or nihilistic view or eternal heaven or all the kind of probabilities and, and permutations on conditioned phenomena that we can create in our mind. We can create limbo, we can create temporary states, uh, different levels, different qualities, from the best to the worst, from the sublime to the uh, ridiculous, to all kinds of, to what's sane and, and practical, to what's stupid and insane. But that which is aware, say, is the, is the, uh, is the escape from that superior to the necessity of faith. <clears throat> so contemplate this in, you know, just to, this is something, you know, that, that you need to, to realize in your own, con in consciousness, not in not through uh, thinking or through, you know, trying to uh, analyze endlessly yourself or Buddhism or whatever, but to take these uh, teachings and put them to, to, so that they actually, you know, they're, thing, they're tools to use. You've asked to use these tools in the monastic Sangha, isn't that? You, you ask to train to use these tools for what? For personal liberation, for personal position, or for liberation from ignorance and conditioned phenomena. So Buddhist monasticism isn't about, you know, reinforcing self, but uh, it's an expedient means, simplification, to, uh, in order to, to make life more simple, less complicated on the external side, the moral, the economic, the political, the social uh, conditions that are very complicated for most people. And that uh, the modern society is very complicated. The, sen the, the personality is a very complicated one. We tend easily to neurosis because we can, we can create endless problems in our mind about little things. You know, we have psycho psychology, psychotherapy, endless, uh, you know, attempts to try to, to iron out the wrinkles of the conditioned world, make it nice and smooth. But the it's the necessity of fate. We are the way we are. We have these thoughts. We have these emotions, uh, these tendencies, these inclinations, habits, good, bad, right, and wrong, refined, of course, or whatever. You, you see them, but are, is, is there anything you can really say is yours? And so this samaditi then, and the, the Eightfold Path, the Fourth Noble Truth, samaditi samasangapo, that's the insight that comes through realizing the deathless. Through the Third Noble Truth, the cessation of conditions. When, when conditions cease, what's left? Is, there's consciousness, awareness, you can prove this to yourself. When there's no self, when there's no attachment to memory or any quality or condition, you can recognize it. Realize it. It's like this. Non-attachment. You can discern it. Attachment you can you know attachment and non-attachment. It's a discerning. It's not saying we shouldn't be attached to anything at all. That's one way of interpreting Buddhism. Is we shouldn't be attached to anything whatsoever, making it a kind of uh, 
you know, imperative and intimidation to, to everyone. And if you show any sign of attachment, that means you're not really a Buddhist, because Buddhists aren't attached to anything. I remember one time, this is before I ordained uh, in Bangkok, uh, this uh, Dr. Burns, who many of you heard of, he was, a, he was an American psychiatrist living in Bangkok. And he was uh, very learned on, on uh, Pali. He, he knew Pali, he, knew, he could speak Thai, and he was very authoritative, and he, he had strong views. And so um, he, uh, he took my wristwatch uh, just to see if I was attached to it. <laughs> he took it off. <laughs> And, you know, I could tell that he wanted me to, to just ignore. You know, if I was a really a Buddhist, I wouldn't care. I'd just say it means nothing to me. But, and so it was, uh, you know, he had this idea that, that one shouldn't be attached to anything. And so wanting, asking for your wristwatch back is like showing attachment, isn't it? Or is it? <laughs> or was he attached to the ideal of non-attachment? That's more like it. He was kind of in an arrogant position of saying, uh, I'm going to prove the how attached you are. Somebody else one time took my glasses, my spectacles, just to see if I was attached, what I would do when I didn't have my spectacles. For all of you who wear glasses, it's quite interesting, isn't it, when, when you can't find your glasses. <laughs> <coughs> Is that attachment? Should we just throw away our spectacles, our wristwatches, to prove we're not attached? And that would still be sakyaditi in many cases, wouldn't it? Because we're trying to, I'm trying to show you how unattached I am by uh, throwing everything out the window. Or, you know, mothers have asked me about attachment to their children. They say, it's, you know, we are so attached to our children. And so I can't really be a Buddhist because of this attachment to children. Is that really what the Buddha is asking you? Is get rid of your children to prove you're not attached? <laughs> and so this is where the non-attachment isn't about getting rid of anything. It's a, an imminent recognition, a discernment. Of, of liberation. Doesn't mean getting rid of your children, it means letting go of your attachments to children, your obsessions, your, the way that, that mothers can suffer so much because of their children, because they're so attached to, they want them to be like this, they, they, they worry, they endlessly create uh, negative conditions, judgments, feelings that they can be aware of. And actually that's, uh, you know, a mother that can really let go of all that is uh, truly a wise mother, somebody to be praised. But it doesn't mean she doesn't love her children, it means that she's freeing herself from ignorant attachment to them for personal neediness, for demanding, for all the things that parents can do to their children by wanting us, needing us, depending on us, uh, and, and uh, hanging on to us, uh, thinking that it's love. Well, this is for contemplation. Love in this sense isn't about, uh, you know, isn't coming from ignorance. It's coming through wisdom. It's not about me liking somebody or needing somebody and saying I love them because I have to have them and hold on to them. I love them so much I can't live without you kind of thing. It's, you know, it's, that's more like obsessive liking or neediness. So in this sense of Brahma Vihara, love is, is not attached. Non-attachment. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's not demanding, not, uh, you know, 
wanting something or not wanting something. So also recognize that that uh, this uh, the second noble truth is about desire, dunha, and this is a very uh, useful way to reflect on desire because it it puts you in a relationship to desire of knowing desire rather than becoming someone with desire. If you don't know desire, then you become someone that has desires. So you have the gamadana, bhavadana, vipuvadana, uh, sensual desire, desire for uh, becoming, ambition, achieving, attaining, vipuvadana, desire for annihilation, for destruction, for getting rid of, suppressing, rejection. Now these are these three categories I found very useful categories on desire on dunha. Dunha is the Pali word for de- translated in English as desire. Now that awareness of desire. Now this is where you need to really really observe desire, get to become an expert, an authority on desire. Not you're trying to get rid of it or become someone who doesn't have any desires, but know what it is. Because the problem isn't really with the desire, it's ignorance, it's avicca. Not knowing desire, not understanding it, then, then we attach to desires blindly. We become our desires. We have no perspective. We're kind of helpless victims of our desires. And that's that's why we suffer. Because we're 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 lost, we're victimized by the desires that we're feeling. Physical, sensual, uh altruistic, uh r- rage and anger, destructive, annihilationist. So then the Conundrum, that which is aware of desire. Is that a desire? How, does, can can Vipavadanha be aware of Bhavadanha? Can the desire to get rid of Bhavadanha be aware of Bhavadanha or of itself? Can Vipavadanha desire to get rid of defilement? desire to get rid of anger and jealousy and fear, desire to get rid of lust, of self-consciousness and all this, desire to get rid of these bad things that ruin our lives. That seems righteous, doesn't it? And that's where uh, righteousness can really be deluding. It can be another form of of, uh, vipavadanha. We get on our high horse, we are right. People shouldn't kill. They shouldn't have abortions. They shouldn't be uh, prejudiced. They shouldn't be, and all that good, all the shouldn'ts. Should be, we should be good and kind and moral and liberal and understanding and compassionate. We, we, this is, we get into our righteous mode. And you can hear it all over the place now in the Anglican Church uh, here in England, America, all the righteous indignation around sexuality, around morality, around, uh, you know, liberal, being liberal or fundamentalists. Being liberal was the kind you want to be kind of tolerant uh, and have a kind of tolerant, uh, a, a beautiful tolerance towards everything, or you want, you're a kind of purist, you're a fundamentalist. We've got to preserve the purity and the, the true meaning of the Bible, and we go on like that. We can do that with Buddhism. Because these are conventions. They're, you know, they can be used skillfully or unskillfully. 
They're used with ignorance or with awareness, wisdom. So righteousness, righteous indignation, you know, you get, you know, full of your self-importance and condemn and preach, is like this, this feeling of, of uh, righteousness is like this. That which is aware of feeling indignant and angry and resentful and righteous is like this. That which is aware is that righteous. Awareness allows things to be what they are, so they, they know, you know, it's like this. I'm not saying you shouldn't be righteous or righteous feelings should be, you should get rid of, but it's recognizing them. Recognizing this, uh, this sense of right and wrong, what should be and shouldn't be, is like this. <coughs> so that's where the, if it sticketh to the constancy of the supernal mind, that needs not move. The thing that, <clears throat> that I've used, as many of you know, is the sound of silence, which people are questioning and curious. Some get it, some don't. Don't make anything out of it. I mean, I'm not trying to, to create a sound of silence practice as some kind of superior practice. It's just a, a way of reflecting. It's about non-attachment. The important thing is the, the, the message is about non-attachment, not about sticking, you know, attaching to the sound of silence through trying to find it or identify with it. It's, a, it's a merely a reflection of noticing, of awareness. So one can get very attached to the idea of the sound of silence or that you can't get it, or that you don't know what it is, or you don't like it, or you, or you, you, you don't see its importance, or it's not really pure Theravada Buddhism, or whatever, you know, you, your feelings about it, you can be aware of that. <clears throat> but in, but through this continuous reminding, this, uh, determination for to the the one fortunate attachment patekarati is this to keep no matter how how strong a feeling is or or whatever to keep whatever you're feeling boredom or laziness or or heat or cold or happiness or depression or whatever being successful or a failure. See, every, every condition that you're experiencing is opportunity for recognizing the unconditioned, that which is aware of the condition, awareness itself. So then samaditi is, even it's translated as right understanding, it's perfect understanding of Dhamma. It's not having a view or opinion about Dhamma anymore. It's not being attached to some fundamental view of Dhamma or righteous view. It's knowing, it's being Dhamma itself. Right understanding, right intention, Sama Sangapo. And then the rest follow from that. Sama Waja, Sama Gamando, Sama Chivo. The way we live, you know, is spontaneous. Action, speech, livelihood come from wisdom rather than from attachments, views, opinions. And then, of course, the last three, sama vayamo, sama sati, sama samadhi. That is 
a balance, isn't it? On the energetic level, the, the emotional, the, the intellectual, the physical are in alignment then. How we live, how we conduct ourselves, our position in the society, our way of relating to the conditioned world is no longer coming from cultural conditioning, personal views and the ego, or from uh, attachment to ideals, views, opinions, b values, but it, it's a spontaneity and knowing, uh, ability to respond to contingencies through understanding, through wisdom, rather than through habit, through reactivity, through cultural prejudices or even religious prejudices. It's no longer having a position that one takes on life, but it's, it's the positionless, it's, it's the wholeness, it's complete, it's perfect. <clears throat> because it's, it's pure consciousness that isn't you know, it's recognized and it has no boundary. We have to bear with the necessity of fate, though, the way we are, the, you know, the, the tendencies that we have, the personal, the personalities, the emotions, the memories, physical uh, conditions we find ourselves with, and the necessity of fate. But we're no longer deluded by fate by the necessity of fate, because sticketh to the constancy of the supernal mind that need not move. Or in, in the uh, Pali tradition, the Four Noble Truths. So this is, uh, you know, to an encouragement. I probably s speak very strongly, <laughs> but uh, you know, it is uh, something to um, to consider. I don't want you to go out, you know, trying to believe me, or uh, you know, I'm not trying to say something new or original. So I, I don't want to become a cult figure, in other words. I'm pointing always to Dhamma, because our refuge is in Buddha Dhamma Sangha. And that to me is a very, is, a, is, a, is on the condition level, on the conventional form, I, I value those, those refuges, because it is, a, you know, it, it is transcends, it's no longer about being European or English or Thai or Japanese or anything like that. It's no, no longer about being male or female or young or old, about being Buddhist or Theravadan or Mahayana or Christian or Jewish or anything like that. It's Buddha awakened consciousness in an individual. Dhamma, reality, Sangha, those who who, who have refuge in Buddha and no Dhamma. That's Sangha, that's uh, uh, Sod Sodapanna, Sakata Kamiana Kamiara, the four stages. As we recognize this way, this through mindfulness, through discerning it, through wisdom, then the, the tendencies, the, the power of the conditioned realm loses its, it, it, it taking the power out of the delusion, delusive, deluding side of it. We still, it's a still a necessity of fate, having to live what remains of this form, and with the uh, personalities and when the conditions arise, then you feel like this. There's, you know, somebody insults me, I feel it. You know, it insults me personally. I can, I certainly feel, I don't, like, it totally indifferent 
to being insulted, but there's a recognition. And the strength lies in referring to, remembering Buddha Dhamma Sangha rather than in believing, uh, how dare you insult me kind of reaction that might happen if I'm not aware. If I just get lost in reactions to insults, then I'm, you know, then, I, then I'm, I've, I'm back into that realm of rebirth, of being somebody who, shouldn't, who should be respected and not insulted. But in terms of Dhamma, then it's, it's awareness. The Buddha isn't about me. Dhamma is not about my Dhamma or Sangha. My, I'm, I am a Sotapanna or Sakadakam or anything like that. Not about claiming or defining, but in, in using these, these, this, these particular conventions, for non-attachment, for wisdom, with wisdom, understanding, liberation. And it does work. It's not a, it's not a, a waste of time. You know, if you, sometimes, you know, in, in the beginning stages, of course, you, you don't have very much confidence and it's, the emotional habits are overwhelming. But this is where this, uh, sense of determination, of one fortunate attachment, Badekarati. Is it, it Badekarati to me means it, reminding myself. But, and then I've used this word Bhutto. Puto is a and then the Thai m- m- mantra that we use in Northeast Thailand. Or just looking at the robe, you know, just looking at this color, this form, rather than taking it in kind of personal, I'm a Buddhist monk, and so forth. It's, it's using the robe for reminding yourself, Sangha, those who, who practice. Supatipano, Ujupatipano, Yaya Patipano, Samiji Patipano. So then, the, and it's not about me being an ajahn or a bhikkhu or anything like that or senior monk. It's about using this for re- reminding. Sangha is my refuge, not not my position, not my titles. So it's not that, you know. It's about th- using the the robe, the alms bowl the Buddha Rupas, the tradition, for this reminder. You, you're surrounded here at Amabhati with, with reminders. You've got Buddha Rupas everywhere. Uh, relics and uh, all these, these uh, forms. Monks and nuns. Seen, seen monks and nuns as Sangha rather than as personalities. And the lay people also use the, the situation here for remembering uh, Supatipano Ujupatipano Sangha. The Buddha Dhamma Sangha is a refuge. And so Buddha is not about, you know, is not mine or Dhamma, is my Dhamma, Ajahn Sumedho's Dhamma, or Sangha is, is Ajahn Sumedho. It's about this, this refuge that transcends the necessity of faith, the sense of identity with, the, with my position, with my body, with my, <clears throat> you know, with the various identities and memories and so forth that might arise because they are the necessity of faith. So this, this uh, Bateka Rati, one fortunate attachment, and it's like, Continuous reminding, no matter what's happening, no matter how painful or arduous a situation might be, find a way of of reminding yourself. Just simple simplicity like puto or mala beads or or using developing a sense of the robe as a 
as a form, as a something to remind you of Sangha rather than of bhikkhu, siladharas, uh, samaneras, anagarikas, and so forth. I think these are senior to those and these are, you know, and we get into the, the attachment to the form. So Sangha then isn't about um, being a monk or a nun. It's about practicing in the right way. It's not about me being, you know, senior bhikkhu and all that and, and, and me being a teacher and all that kind of thing. Those are, <coughs> those are the necessities of faith. But that which is superior to that is the awareness. And the awareness then, the constancy of the supernal mind which needs not move. Then the conditions move through consciousness and they are what they are. Good, bad, right, wrong, pleasant, painful. Accordingly. And, and also you begin to see the, the, the pain, the misery of being somebody, of being a person, being a monk or a nun, being a Buddhist, being what? Anything, any condition. The suffering of identity, of attachment, clinging, ignorance, attachment, and desire that come from ignorance of Dhamma. So the Buddha as a refuge is knowing, is knowing attention in the present, knowing the way it is, awakening to reality. And then as individual humans, our refuge is Sangha rather than in positions or identities on a, you know, as on, on a personal level, of making making monasticism into some kind of personal identity. It's not meant to be that. And we're not trying to, to, to uh, you know, say that, you know, like intimidate the lay community. We're not priests or better or purer or superior to lay, lay community. We're interdependent, aren't we? We need the lay community. So, and the lay community, you need to develop ways of reminding yourself of your refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha rather than in your emotions and views and opinions and worldly problems. Now they're the necessity of fate, but learn to trust yourself more by awakening, observing, no matter what, how difficult your life might be at times, you know, it, it doesn't, it's not an obstruction to, to liberation. If you're willing to, just even for a second, remind yourself or just remember Puto, even if you forget it the next moment. Eventually, the power of Puto will uh, be stronger than your tendency to get overwhelmed with your feelings of, of the present mo mo of the present moment. The supernal mind, constancy of the supernal mind that needs not move. <clears throat> Superior to the necessity of fate. So I leave that with you. <laughs> that was Bothi Bothius, a Roman philosopher and politician around 480 A.D., never heard of him before, but uh, you keep running across these, uh, these quotes, and some of them really jump out at me. You know, that one particularly did years ago. I found this many years ago. <clears throat> kind of, you know, you, sudden, you have a, they suddenly know what they mean, and uh, I've never used it uh, as I'm using it now, you know, but I, I do find it a, a kind of reinforcement of my emphasis on, the, on what we did in the winter's retreat of the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. Because this is, 
universal wisdom, isn't it? This is, you know, it's not about even being Buddhist. Buddhism is a skillful means. As, uh, Theravada, Pali, uh, suttas are to be used skillfully with awareness, not for identity and, uh, and through uh, clinging and ignorance, but through awakening. And that you have to do. That's something no one can do for you. So I offer this as a reflection.